All the late night shows, this is the easiest one to fall asleep to. You look like George Clooney if George's mom drank during her pregnancy. <laughs> to me, your comedy is like crypto. I don't understand it, but I admire it. And I didn't even know there was an audience. I'd heard the monologue, but you know. <laughs> Sometimes you come across talk show moments that are either cringe. You smell good, which is surprising. <laughs> Why is that Ew. surprising? I don't know. I just wouldn't think of a you, a guy who would have a nice scent on. And it's that's seems such a like. I'm gonna really work hard to not take that as a shot. <laughs> Extremely heartfelt. I thank you for for watching it, for hate watching it, whatever reason you were tuning in for. Yeah. Or simply hilarious. You ready? Yeah. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, mother up. Now I'll tell you with me, eating has replaced sex completely. In fact, I had a mirror put in over my kitchen table. <laughs> but rarely are people outwardly rude to those who interview them. No, I mean you're pale. <laughs> yes, you're a pale. You, you I'm look, a white you, man. You yeah. make Mike Pence look like a character in Black Panther. <laughs> Everyone except for Martin Short. You know, I've been on your show many times. Many I've times. never seen the show funnier than tonight. <laughs> I'm serious. Oh my God, your yeah. skin is so youthful. Thank you. Thank uh, you. It's not firm, but it's youthful. <laughs> so exciting for me to be talking to you because usually I talk to celebrities. You look like a number two pencil. <laughs> <laughs> So there's this etiquette on talk shows, a certain level of professionalism you need to maintain in order to both properly promote what it is you're there for and keep the audience engaged. Just because the audience doesn't laugh out loud <laughs> doesn't mean that they're not laughing on the inside. <laughs> I, I heard laughter, Marty. I did. You did? Laughter. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was Jimmy's. <laughs> But before every televised appearance, there's a rehearsal, a practice interview meant to ease tension and create a sharper exchange. But what happens when the guest doesn't stick to the script? What happens when they thrive off of the tension and the interviewer ends up being the one on their back foot? You never age, Jimmy. You I don't. don't. You don't. You, you, I bet you're the only late night host that goes to a pediatrician. Thank yeah. you. Uh, that's <laughs> Steve Higgins right there. You love Steve Higgins. Oh my God. Uh, he looks to me like the world's most jovial undertaker. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you're not familiar with Martin Short, you're probably wondering who keeps letting this guy wreak havoc on TV? Why do the hosts seem to be either having the time of their lives alongside him? To me, when I see you, you look like someone freeze-dried Prince Harry. That's all I say. <laughs> or just feel like they're putting up with it. Well, here's the thing. Martin Short is no stranger to the limelight. I mean, we're talking about a guy who's been in the industry nearly 50 years with a resume that most professionals could only dream to see a fraction of. If you're not aware, he's arguably one of the greatest comedic minds of all time. A lifetime of exceptional work. I don't know how many times he was on our show, but I'm telling you, for me, it was like a holiday. However, it took a while for him to get here. See, Short's been active in the entertainment scene since the early 70s. While his start was on the theater stage, he'd sharpen his comedic chops through the renowned Second City. I'm Second City, you're Second City, but yeah. you were Second City Toronto, and I was Second right. City Chicago. An improv comedy troupe that's seen the likes of comedic greats like John Candy, Steve Carell, and Chris Farley. When you watch his interviews, you wonder, how is he so sharp? I think you were maybe the best story teller in Hollywood. The thing is, improv teaches you to be incredibly quick-witted. I think that I was drawn toward character work, and there was a part of me that was drawn toward the absurdity. Given that they perform regularly in front of a large crowd, there's an immense amount of anxiety you need to overcome in order to be quick on your feet. After a while, though, it becomes far easier. It's why so many comedians get their start on the small stage. You know, all these characters, I think, come from people you know or combinations of people you know. And, and, and it's kind of good that they do because that creates, even though there might be absurdist characters, it creates a th kind of three dimension. By the late 70s, Short was already building his resume within the industry. And by the early 80s, would catch the attention of SNL producer Lauren Michaels. What do you think when you think of the name Lauren Michaels? I think of a, a, a longtime friend and I think of one of the great innovators in the history of show business. SNL had a pretty big issue on their hands 
hands, it was struggling to retain viewers and to make matters worse, Eddie Murphy had left the show amidst a booming career. However, Martin Short's addition would help completely turn the tide. And I can show you equal numbers of studies that prove that smoking can be beneficial for you. You can? Yes. Well, could you name them? Why should I name them? Why don't you name them? <laughs> His characters were not only creative, but incredibly well performed. To call him a hit would be an understatement. Because I had a one year contract, they're also paying us more money than they'd ever paid people. So I felt like, come on, be funny, be funny. Yet there was one glaring problem. SNL's workload was vastly different than what he was used to. I just wanted to survive. I didn't want to be in nine scenes. I wanted to be in two scenes. Right. Second City provided him with a more lenient work schedule and a less stressful environment. There was far more rehearsal, as opposed to SNL where they'd often perform skits live on the air for the first time. He was so overwhelmed by the workload that by the third episode, he was already writing his resignation letter. And again, after the third show, I went back and I had a meeting with Dick Ebersole and I said I want to leave. However, he decided to tough it out for a full season, eventually leaving to pursue a wildly successful career in film. You know, if I drop this thing, it's gonna go off and you'll all be blown to smithereens, so move it! Since his career began taking off, he'd been making far more appearances on different talk shows. It was here where we saw his improvisational skills really begin to shine. Have you had a rib removed? No. What is it? <laughs> oh, is it the really... new chin? No, I just take care of myself. I watch for <laughs> Is it the new chin? Yeah. Able to punch back and conjure up witty remarks on the fly like it was his second nature. I have the best hair in the business. You, you're an expert, right? Don't well, I, have... I mean, first of all, you can barely see netting, and secondly, <laughs> He'd sharpen his expertise not only as a guest, but as the host. You know, you have a very obnoxious way of talking. Thank you. Yeah, it's not a compliment, moron. You're a moron. Oh, I'm a yeah, moron. Yes, you. You are a moron. This yeah. is the famous Larry David Anger. And are you filled with anger? How did you find Jiminy? How did you, where did he come from? You know, I was always fascinated by morons with power. <laughs> SNL and Second City had given him plenty of characters to experiment with. One of his most memorable was that of Jiminy Click. This is the craziest f***ing interview I've ever done in my life. That's why they call me multidimensional. Why was it called Fridays? Well, because it was just like Saturday Night Live. But not funny. But not funny. Yes. <laughs> yes. This character was a bumbling, manic, and at times nonsensical interviewer. And you've made so many films. When are you gonna do the big one? <laughs> what do you mean big one? Something that clicks with the public. Something that clicks with the public. Yeah. His entire thing was creating tension and awkward moments. You've had an interesting career, haven't you? Yes, I have. I don't know a great deal about it. <laughs> I see that you haven't been through hair or makeup. <laughs> <laughs> that was a choice. Martin Short had a much easier time masking the anxiety under a fat suit and complete creative control. Short's ability to adapt to nearly any celebrity was on full display here. <clears throat> oh, you're hungry. I'm sorry. I, I, I have a big celebrity coming to sit here in a second, but I think I ordered a club sandwich covered in stevia. <laughs> He was even comfortable touching topics that, had he not been in character, would have seemed off limits for a talk show. If I hear one more, one more anti-Semitic remark from your mouth. Oh, so now we're pretending that your people don't litigate. Okay. <laughs> with this experience, he'd grown desensitized to the discomfort that came with being either the interviewer or the one in the hot seat. He doesn't come with the same anxiety as most people would, nor does he adhere to the same standards. See, when Martin Short is on a talk show, he commands the entire exchange. Jimmy <laughs> is to giggling what romaine lettuce is to E. coli. Thank you, well, I... <laughs> There are those who can play along, able to roll with the punches and adapt to his sarcastic remarks. Marty, I love it when you're on for a period of time and then, <laughs> and then you're glad that I'm gone. And then I'm so glad you're gone. Uh -huh. uh, or those who seem to stall under the pressure. If someone had told me 20 years ago that I would be on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon with all these Emmy nominations, I would have said, Jimmy Fallon? <laughs> you know, that's what you I never thought of it that way. Martin Short is a strong test of a host's temperament. You look like the world. 
world's hippest insurance adjuster. You really do. No, and I mean that with love. Thank you very yeah. much. I'm, take, I'm taking it with nothing okay. but love. If you're seasoned, you know that for the most part, it's just a bit. Some would even say they're relieved. I could relax and as a viewer, a person in the audience or somebody at home, I could just enjoy Marty just being near him. When he's on, the host is able to relax, take their foot off of the gas pedal and let him work his charm. It's almost like they're the ones being interviewed. Martin Short is, at the end of the day, an entertainer. His purpose is to create interest and laughter with a bit of a mischievous twist. The audience is still saying, oh, he's not any good. And they're not, it, and if you have a joke that kills, so if you're the person doing those jokes and they're not working, you're very aware of the low. But if you ask his friends and those in the industry, they'll tell you he's the exact opposite off stage. Martin Short is an incredibly empathetic individual. I do love you very much, as you Aww. know. It's true. He's lived a life that, at times, was riddled with tragedy. The loss of your wife. Yeah. Listen, I can have a full conversation with Nancy right now, as if she's here. I, I know exactly what she'd say, because you do. We were together for 36 years. It's shaped and molded the man he is today. Comedy, I'm sure, served as an escape. You know, I think in a way, work is the greatest healer to that because, you know, she wasn't necessarily in Boston as I'm putting on a suit and ready to go on stage. She was home. It's when you're home that it becomes more apparent. A way to build relationships and cope with the turmoil that came with great loss. So when you think of why most great hosts tend to roll with the punches, you realize that there's an intense amount of mutual respect here. Martin Short, among the best talk show guests of all time, without a doubt, and super fun to collaborate with. They know that, at the end of the day, it's just comedy. They know he's not acting with ill intent. They know that he's dealt with enough loss to empathize with nearly anyone. They know that, after 50 years in the industry, he's done more than enough to earn his stripes and are just happy to be sitting in the presence of comedy greatness. You know, of all the people that I admire in, in, in show business, you're very close to being one of them. And it, <laughs> and it is. So when the question arises, why let this guy wreak havoc on your talk show? I think the answer is simple. If Martin Short is comfortable enough in your presence to roast you, how long were you on the embalming table before you okay, jumped out? That's, okay, just, that's terrible. It means you're doing pretty damn well. <laughs>